from London, England, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering Discover 2015. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in London, England for HP Enterprise Discover or hashtag HPE Discover. Go to crowdchat.net slash HPE Discover. Join the conversation. This is Silicon Angles The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Sue Barsamian, who's the SVP and General Manager of the Enterprise Security Products Group within HPE, HP Enterprise. <laughs> Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. It's great <laughs> to be soon. here. Uh, exciting first official HPE Discover here in London. Yeah. Um, been a great success. You manage probably one of the, one of the most dynamic areas mm -hmm. in the industry right now, security. Um, it's kind of like the public secret that everyone won't talk about, but is talking about, which is everyone's scrambling because yeah. it's so dynamic, the technologies are shifting, the attack surface areas for, for hackers and uh, criminals, and just human mistakes yeah. <laughs> inside yeah. enterprises um, are causing a lot of uh, leaks, incidents, breaches, and a lot of damage. And certainly there's now kind of a, kind of a cyber warfare, certainly yeah. between nations, huge yeah. issues. What's, what, yeah. how, do you, how, do you, well, how do you survive every day? Give us a, well give us a peek said, in your life. Um, you know, it is, the sense of urgency is going up dramatically. And I think every time one of these public breaches happens, um, the urgency goes up even more. And you know, the landscape is changing very significantly. The attacks are getting more sophisticated and more serious. It is, it is nation states these days. It's no longer dorm room hackers. It's serious stuff. Um, and the complexities of the landscape that you're trying to protect is dramatically different. You've got cloud, you've got mobile, you've got big data which takes customer sensitive data and spreads it everywhere, that's a very complicated landscape to try to protect. And just, you know, in the news today, Toymaker, uh, VTech announced 190 gigs of child and parent photos and chat logs between parents and children from late 2014 to 2015, exposed IP addresses, download history, five million accounts, names, email accounts, kids' names, genders, and birth dates, huge data, just data breach today. Wow, that's I, today. I missed that one. So that's it's that's breaking, yeah. breaking news very today. Very typical. So this yeah. is very much what we're yeah. seeing. This is now the new thing. So new security methods are trying to be solved in real time. Yeah. The perimeter is no longer guarded. Virtualization technology could be an answer. Take us through, what are the, what are the critical things going on inside the, inside the uh, ivory tower with an HP and also in the labs and in yeah. the product groups because you guys right. are probably squirreling away <laughs> beavering away, making new products. We need answers, what's yeah. the solution? Well, you said a couple things there, John. Uh, the perimeter is no longer the perimeter. You know, in the old days, I don't want to say security was easy, but it was certainly simpler than it is today. And that is largely because most of what you cared about was on a managed network, um, and most of the people that were accessing it were on managed devices that you controlled if you were IT. Um, so, if you look at the last 10 years of security spending, over half of it has gone into blocking known threats at the perimeter and at the endpoint. In today's environment, the information that you care about, some of it still sits on the corporate network, a lot of it is in the cloud, both the private cloud as well as the public cloud, which you don't control as much. And in the world of BYOD, you no longer have control over the endpoint. People are calling in from Starbucks on their mobile phone into a corporate application or into corporate data that sits in the public cloud. It's a very different so what's the answer? We had Dominic Orr on earlier talking about the awesomeness of what Aruba's doing with yeah. all the different software opportunities that are kind of, he was kind of teasing out, he couldn't say, he was smiling, but I can almost tease it out that there's some stuff going on between security group, big data, that takes the pressure off the revenue line that he has to produce called yeah. access point pricing. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of data involved, he can dissect that. So if I'm in Starbucks, these are new things yeah. coming. Are these some of the things we're seeing? Can you so, give us some examples? Fundamentally, you need to shift from protecting the perimeter and the endpoint exclusively to focusing more on protecting the target. And when you protect the target, if you think about what everybody's after, they're after the data. 99% of breaches, let's say, are about the data. 
Most of that is about uh, personally identifiable data or payment card data. 85% of the time, the route to the data is through an application. So we say the application actually is the new perimeter because the application wraps the data and the data is the target. So if you focus on hardening the data by securing it, by encrypting it, by tokenizing it, and hardening the application through application security, like our yep. Fortify product line, that is a great place to start. Then when you look at the infrastructure that that sits on, whether it's the server, the storage, or DOM's you know, networking switches, you can also build security into the, the infrastructure layer, and naturally you would think that would be a great play for HP, given that yeah. we're a yeah, yeah. significant infrastructure player, <laughs> so my partners in crime, if you will, in security products business are my infrastructure colleagues. They have to integrate, I mean. Totally. They have to integrate. It's a great play. And the overhead yeah. issue goes away now with compute becoming more advanced, lower cost. Yeah, overhead, um, Yes, because what, in Sorry. fact, I just came out of a customer meeting this morning, and what we heard was make it seamless, don't bolt it on, build it in. And that is an important mantra for us, and that means build it into whatever hardware or software stack I'm running, and build it into my IT processes. So if I'm developing my apps using a DevOps process, build security into DevOps. If I'm using an incident management process for managing incidents, manage security incidents the same way. So building it in is an important mantra for us in security. So you're talking about the, the, the shift from the perimeter to the target and how the access you know, gets, gets to that target. And you've rationalized your portfolio, you, you delevered a tipping point, uh, presumably to focus on, on yeah. that trend. I wonder if you could talk about that strategy a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So we did just recently divest of Tipping Point. Um, we still believe that network analytics is an important part of our SIM strategy. But if you look at really the two pillars of the strategy today, one is in the area that I talked about protecting the target. And for us that is application security and data security sitting on top of a secure infrastructure stack, all from HP, all in an open environment. The second is in what we would call detect and respond, and this is really where ArcSight comes in. Um, assuming you have been breached, you need to be able to find the threats, both the known threats at scale, as well as increasingly find unknown threats using analytics and machine learning, and that's all about ArcSight and what ArcSight does to really be the command and control center for a security operations center. Yeah, so the stat I love, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's something like, it, on average it's 250 days yeah. to detect an intrusion. Yeah. I think Stuxnet kind of changed yeah. everything, didn't it? Yeah. And so how are you using specifically analytics to, to solve that problem? Yeah, so Stuxnet is a great example, the Sony breach is another great example, mm -hmm. and I think the stat, Dave, that you mentioned, it was 254 days is the average length of time that the attackers are in, because it takes you some time. Once you get in, it takes you some time to figure out how you can compromise the servers, get to the data, and do whatever it is you want to do. And if you look at the Sony breach as an example, that was a very sophisticated attack that included a whole host of things, including taking confidential IP and emails, exposing them to the internet, but also included essentially taking down servers in the data center. So, very complicated landscape. Orchestrated, targeted. Very, very orchestrated and very so targeted. So, if there's time to get in, so, if, which I would agree, they want to kind of get in there high and then start poking around and seeing what they can steal, uh, means that threat detection is key. So, yeah. identifying the pattern, so big data, a good yeah. opportunity there. A new method is emerging around deception deception-based techniques. Um, yeah. Where you're essentially not yeah. honeypot, you're acting like a Fake server, honeypot. Yeah, yeah. faking a yeah. server. Um, talk about these dynamics. Are these new techniques? Are they just recycled paradigms coming into a new era? Yeah, what so are some of the things that you guys are doing? You can look at, um, so a couple, couple interesting threads there. One, deception, kind of next evolution of, of honeypots. Really baiting, if you will, baiting the adversary so that you can watch and learn, and why do you want to watch and learn, not, not just for sport, 
but so that you can become smarter and yeah. then mitigate future risks. And obviously, so you operate on the assumption that they're already in. To your point, uh, yeah, that they're going to come in and poke around, in. right? Yeah, and and in fact, you see security spend shifting now to increasingly be on detection and response. Again, this is a balance. It's not one in yeah. lieu of the other. It's all a balance of how you spend. And you see detection and response, investigation and forensics being really double digit growth areas in security right now because they're in. You need to find them, you need to um, contain them and mitigate you know, any damage yeah. from the fact that they're already in. So and assuming that they're, you got to assume that they're in and then use techniques yeah. At whatever you got, yeah. <laughs> throw and everything at it. And because these, these threats are changing so rapidly, the percentage of time that the threat is unknown as opposed to known, right? You can, once you know about a threat, you can create a rule, create a filter, and ArcSight and other systems are great at finding known threats at scale. Finding an unknown threat is where you need the analytics and the machine yeah. learning, because then what it's about is baselining normal. Right, yeah. you want to create a baseline of what is normal behavior so that I can then detect abnormal behavior, which would be indicative of potentially malicious behavior. So I wonder if you could talk about uh, encryption. Um, you know, it used to be, you'd love to encrypt everything yeah. if you could, but it was expensive, processor intensive, but now with sort of more processing power, and you're seeing like Intel, for instance, really drive security into the, into the chip, you've seen some others do that as well. Where does encryption fit? Yeah. Is it sort of you know, becoming a mainstream technology now or is it, there are still trade-offs associated with it? Well, it's really interesting because when you think about the fact that 99% of this is about getting to the data, you would think there was a lot more sophisticated encryption going on than there actually is. Most people encrypt, but they encrypt at the level of the endpoint or the hard drive. And what that does is that protects you in the event that somebody takes that drive out of the system. Um, and that's an interesting use case, but that doesn't protect your data against a malicious adversary or malware or et cetera. And really what you want to do then is have a comprehensive approach to encryption that protects the data at rest, in motion, in use, essentially as it's captured, as it's processed or wherever it's stored. The reason that hasn't happened more pervasively is that traditional encryption technologies don't preserve the format of the data, which means you could take a 32 character last name or a 12 character social security number and encrypt it and it could end up 120 characters. That wreaks havoc on the applications that are trying to work with that data. And that means that you're constantly encrypting, decrypting, encrypting, decrypting. That in and of itself is complex and risky. We have now format preserving encryption, which really for the first time says if it's a 32 character name, it's going to be 32 characters encrypted. If it's a 12 character social security number, it's going to stay 12 characters. That means you can move it around the system and apps can operate on it and know that it is legitimate even without decrypting it. That all of a sudden opens a much broader aperture to people encrypting at broader and scale. And if I understand it correctly, that would simplify the key management, is that, is that right? Uh, so key management then rides fairly simply on top of this and we've had key management, um, actually what's interesting is key management is our longest running security business at <laughs> HP. It actually came with Atala as part of the oh, tandem okay. acquisition through Compaq. <laughs> so key management we've been awesome at for decades. Um, that sits now alongside our newest addition to the security portfolio, which is our encryption portfolio that came along with the voltage acquisition just this past April. And, and what about like sort of, you know, f more, f more futuristic stuff? I would have to ask you, uh, we've had some guests in theCUBE and we've read about things like the Bitcoin blockchain and things like MIT's Enigma, uh, you know, emerging where you don't have necessarily a trusted third party, you sort of eliminate uh, that, that notion. Are there things on the horizon that we can expect to really sort of up the good guys game, if you yeah. will? Yeah. 
Yeah, that um, there's hope. There is hope for the good guys. You should feel good about that. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of disruptive things going on. Whether it's looking at, um, you know, how does Bitcoin essentially change the game there? You've also heard about HP's new machine, and so when you think about um, the importance of analytics and machine learning to track unknown threats, but the processing intensive nature of doing that. How do you do that in an environment where you have m much more unlimited capacity, the machine makes that a lot easier. The machine also, by the nature of the way it's constructed, actually becomes a simpler environment to secure. So what we're doing now is really kind of bridging towards, if you think about it in terms of horizons, right, we're bridging from the current horizon to the next horizon and eventually getting to the machine and being in, I think, a very different security world. And one where, you know, we can start to really turn the tables. How, where is the machine with the, with the things you just said threaded together? How far along? When is that going to product be available? Yeah, so it's actually, I think when we first started talking about the machine, it was commercially available in the three year time frame. That's now a year and a half away. So we look at the first releases of the machine now being in 17, um, and that will obviously phase over time, but it's... it's and what's the stopgap? Just throw a bunch of servers at the problem? And well, until the machine comes out? Yeah, you know, scale out, out environment. The machine allows you to do in a single unit what would take m m much more you know, federated units together to yeah. do today. So what's the big conversation that you have with customers? So take us through the day in the life, uh, the customer interaction. Yeah. Um, are they as stressed out, are they calm? Obviously, VTech today news is breach, another big significant breach. I mean, what, is, what, are the top converse, what are the top three conversations that, that you have with customers? I think the more, um, the more sophisticated the customers are, um, the more urgency they have around the topic because they're aware. Um, I think a, there's a certain category of customers, and you see those more in the mid-market, that are um, not as far up the maturity curve, not as aware of the magnitude of threats out there, haven't themselves been um, on the receiving end of an attack. Right now you see that you know, very large enterprise-centric in terms of what you read about in the press. But I think what you see happening now is the adversaries are going mid-market because as the larger enterprises get better at protecting themselves, the mid-market becomes the easier target and they're not as far up the security maturity curve. So we hear two very different conversations. In the large enterprise, it's really what we talked about earlier, build it in. I, I don't want to bolt it on. You know, depending upon the statistic you believe, large enterprises are running anywhere between 40 and 60 different security products. That's a lot. I mean, the, it's the, a lot the, to they manage. try every one new one that comes out. It's a lot it's to like, manage. It's like, why not try the right. new security product? So, yeah. but that what sticks may not be. I mean. So, so the refrain, needless to say, from the large enterprises <laughs> is build it in, I'm tired of bolting it on. So. We spend a lot of time with those customers talking about from the hardware to the app to the data, how are we going to build it in? Yeah, you would think that would bode well for a large company like HP and some of your other larger competitors. Is the market swinging to those guys versus sort of point products? Or? So we're, I mean, this is really our strong point of view now in response to the cry from the customers that, um, you know, it's not only I can't mm -hmm. manage all these products, but think about it. What's the role of a security product, it spits out alerts, right? At some point, you don't have the staff. Yeah. The vacancy rates for cybersecurity analysts right now, for frontline analysts, 40% vacancy rate. For first line managers, 58% vacancy rate. So you have an incredible staff shortage of people that are able to follow up on the alert. You can't scale your business. You can't scale your business, you can't scale That's your That's where teams. machine learning comes in. This is That's where it's exactly. interesting. Yeah. The, the huge gap in skills is an opportunity right. for software. So we try to take it, A, build it in, and then take it as far down the path to action as you possibly can so that you need the intervention of a human only in the last mile, if you will. The mid-market conversation is very different. Mid-market customers, for the most part, 
are not going to build and manage their own socks. They're great customers for our managed security services. You can get that through Hewlett Packard Enterprise. You can get it through any number of 40 to 50 managed security providers that we provide infrastructure and software to. And that's a great proposition for the mid-market. We're here at Sue Barsamian, an SVP and General Manager Security Group, um, here at HP Discover in London, it's theCUBE. Final question, what do you guys share with customers? What's the big news here for the security team, your team here in London, obviously the first official yeah. post-split, even though you've been operating as a split company for a while, but November 1st was the fiscal year of the new split. What's the key story here for your customers? What are you guys sharing? Yeah. Can you share with us? So today is the debut of the four transformation areas for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and protecting your digital enterprise is one of the four. Uh, and I would argue the most important of the four because if you can't secure it, the other three really don't matter. Okay. Um, and so what we're doing here at Discover is laying out the portfolio of assets and the end-to-end -end value proposition for HP around protecting your digital enterprise. By the way, as you bring those security assets together, we're a top five security player in the enterprise space today, which most of our customers don't realize because we haven't brought what Dom's doing in security, what I'm doing in security, we haven't brought it together. But when you bring it together and you measure- But you will, that's your yeah, goal. Yeah, we're bringing it together. And that is, that is really the news, is we're debuting that portfolio strategy here in Discover London. Bringing it all together, not bolting it on, but building, building it, it in. in. Yeah. So you're a pillar you in the transformation, <laughs> but you're also building in yeah. cross-functionally. Sue, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate you, spending the time. Great to have you. Yeah. Congratulations. Obviously, big, big focus area. One of the key transformation areas is security. We're here talking about inside theCUBE. We'll be right back with more of our flagship product here live in London after this short break. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.